Thank you all very much for coming to today's price action webinar. And my name is Christopher Pree here. And uh, first off, I hope everybody's having a good day today. Uh, how is everybody doing today? Everybody doing well? How's trading been so far this week? I imagine trading's been interesting for some people. Good. William says good. Hansen from Indonesia, hello. Dry Digger, it looks like you're you're re you're re eventually losing money. It looks like you're eventually losing money. On what? <laughs> that would be uh that would be news to me. <laughs> if I'm losing money. That would be that would be shocking news to me and probably to my clients at the same time. <laughs> uh, I actually this last weekend uh, spent some time doing some analysis on my trading. Oh, on power cuts, yeah, and internet outs, yeah. It doesn't help, but I'm not uh, I'm not in any trades right now. I got out of my trades about two and a half hours ago, so uh, so I'm fine with that. But uh, yeah, I actually did some analysis on my trading and. Um, I found out that for the year I'm clocking in at 77% accuracy, 77 and change, and um, I'm just under 50% up for the year. So it's been a, a really good year. It's been a really strong year, um, and so I'm feeling I'm feeling very good about it. I mean, I've definitely had. There's definitely been some interesting events that I was able to, you know, do really well on. Um, you know, the 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 Nikkei index. The, the massive fall that it had and then the massive rise after that. Um, there's just been a couple of unique environments that definitely helped, but it's also been just consistent trading. So, Well, today we're going to actually go with continuation theme on something that we've been talking about for the last two days or last two weeks, which is uh, we've been talking about silver, spot silver. And I, I, you know, I've been very active in silver the last few weeks, and I often find that my sometimes my personal experiences with trading um, can often provide good fodder or material for these classes, especially when I'm using the very specific techniques in these classes. Sometimes I'm using techniques that are, you know, I don't teach in this class, which this class is a has a has a focus subject, which is price action trading. And so sometimes I'm using techniques that you know aren't related to this, but lately I have been using techniques specifically uh, to trade silver and all on price action. And you know uh, we talked about last week. Uh, in fact, this is the chart we were looking at when the when the uh, we were doing the class last week. We were talking about how silver had shown some signs of possible bottoming, but that we also used, but that we also had commented. That there was a certain tentativeness of it, and it wasn't totally convincing. And so we're going to re-break down that decision just to kind of to repass over that, and then we're going to go over uh, my next trading decision on why I reverse course not too long after that. And we'll talk about what it is that I went through, what the process I went through, what I saw, and everything, and how that actually. Uh, how that decision was made strictly from pure price action. Now Haley's here. Haley, I wish you were here last week. Um, we had covered the. I know you were thinking of buying silver at 42 and 40 uh, two weeks ago when we were predicting that there was going to be a massive drop in silver, and uh, and uh, hopefully you didn't buy it. <laughs> As silver proceeded to have its worst one-week sell-off in the last 10 years. <laughs> And uh, you know what we had suspected true did come true, and you know, and that and that just further undermined not trading blindly support and resistance, but paying attention to price action because price action is the live expression of the market in real time, and that's something that's critical. We're not just relating on the past; we're relating on the present, you know. And so it's very critical that we're always relating to the present. And not just looking at the past and expecting the present to always be like the past, because it won't always be like that. Maybe with politicians, we can look at the past and that they'll generally be like that's the same in the present. I don't know. I haven't seen too many politicians that really diverge from the 
general course of things. But with trading, we still always have to pay attention to the present. Wow, we got a question already from Dry Desert, which is, says, do you still use Ichimoku much in actual trading? I do. Um, I do use Ichimoku on trading. I'm just very selective with how I trade as a whole now. I'm much, you know, as I get older, I get, you know, I've been doing this for over 10 years. Um, I, I seem to be getting more and more selective. And as I get more and more selective, my accuracy continues to grow up. So far, uh, this year is the, the most accurate year I've had so far. I mean, I've had, you know, some where, you know, some that were close to 70%, some above 70%, but, you know, clocking in at 77%, you know, is, is the highest I've, you know, for, for a five month period is, I think the, the best five month performance I've had in a while, so. Um, but yeah, I still use Ichimoku, I'm just very selective about it. As I am with all my strategies. Okay, so with that being said, I want to get into the price action elements that we had briefly mentioned last week, for those who didn't come last week, what we were doing with the silver trade. This is spot silver on the four hour chart that you're looking at. And this is the chart we were looking at last week. I'm going to briefly cover over that and then I want to go over what happened after that, what I was seeing, and then what caused me to reverse course strictly from a price action perspective. So we had talked about the massive drop in silver from 49 down to 33. It was just an enormous drop. Um, two weeks ago, you know, silver was right around 43, and based on it was actually right here on this candle right here, and we had predicted that it was going to break down further, and that we didn't want to buy it necessarily at 42 or 40. We were thinking it was going to sell off much more, much further. And part of that was because you know the the red candles were completely larger than the blue candles they were coming in greater frequency and they were really just overpowering the blue candles which communicates from an order flow perspective that the sellers are coming in with much more force in the market than the buyers so that tells you who's in control and that's critical to understand it's critical to understand price action as being a reflection or live expression of order flow in real time, not just in real time, but what order flow did in the past. And so when we can really peer into that perspective, then we can start to really understand how to trade the market and trade from a price action perspective. The market then proceeded to sell off as we had anticipated. And, you know, it just showed the complete dominance of the sell side in this market with so many red candles and only just a few little spatterings of blue candles here. Then we talked about this little candle, or this candle here, and how it was kind of unique that the market started to make new lows, pierce new lows, but then really punched in a new high. And this candle really took out the last four and a half candles of selling. So you're talking 16 to 20 hours of selling, and it had kind of regained most of that ground. Then the next two candles were red, but they kept showing wicks to the downside, suggesting that every time this was selling off, somebody was scooping it up and wanting to buy it lower so that they could push it back up. And that was further confirmed by one, two, three, four, five candles, 20 hours of straight buying. Now it's not massive buying, but it was steady consistent buying. And it was suggesting that somebody was really attempting to, you know, at least to some degree, to put in a low off of, on the, on the spot silver. But it may not have been necessarily some, you know, like there was another side of the market that says, we think this should go long and we're going to buy here. Oftentimes, when somebody comes in with a counter-aggressive move, like, for example, we have an impulsive move to the downside. And if you remember the rule of thumb I've been talking about, which is the general patterns for price action are impulsive moves or followed by corrective moves, which are then generally 75% of the time followed by impulsive moves in the same direction as the original impulsive move. And that sequence tends to continue until an impulsive move is countered by a counter trend impulsive move. And that's when that sequence tends to break down. So that sequence is generally very stable until it reaches that counter trend impulsive move. It had started off counter trend impulsive, but then it kind of petered off. And one of the ways you can know it was impulsive would be based on the angle of the price action. Here, the angles of the price action are very sharp. 
and this one is much flatter in nature. It's, it's still strong. It's at about a 45 degree angle. But the bottom line is it's still somewhat flat in nature. If it was just as sharp, then that would tell you that the this attempt to reverse the market was very strong and legitimate. But as we noted last week, the angle is a little bit flatter and it's a little tentative. You know, it's taking one, two, three, four, five, six, seven candles to regrain the ground that one, two candles did in selling. So you have the buyers which are taking 24 to 28 hours to push it up roughly three dollars whereas the sellers are only taking eight hours to do that so that tells you who's the stronger force there and who is the one that's more pervasive in the markets so we kept noting how there was a certain tentative of this but that the tentativeness couldn't be denied to some degree that we had to at least pay attention to it and so that I took a long position once it broke above this I took a long position buying back off the 20 EMA, thinking that, hey, it's the first time it's been above the 20 EMA in a long time. It will probably use it as support. It came back and used it as support and confirmed this, and these two little rejections and close above it also confirmed this. So I suspected that it would, the market would go long. But I, with all this tentative gains here, I had this feeling it wasn't going to go super far. I'm going to explain to you the three targets I had and then what caused me to reverse course midway through this whole process. So I looked at this and said, okay, you know what, this was a major down move. Let's pull a fib from top to bottom, and let's see where this is at. I said, okay, so, you know, I liked where these fibs lined up, particularly this one here. And here I was at the time of last week, and when I made the trade, I was here. And I said, okay, you know what, I have the feeling that this thing will probably go to at least here. But I want to take profit a little bit short of that because it seems a little tentative to me. And when it's tentative, it's generally saying the market's not fully committed, so the chances of you gaining massive R, massive reward on it, are less. So therefore, you have to scale back on your, your profits, basically. So I set up three profit targets. I had a 50 cent profit target from the 20 MA. The 20 MA at that time I think was at 53. Let's see where it was at. It was at, and I'll tell you here. It was at 55. I got in at 60, I think it was, I got in at 62, 63. So just about eight points above that. And my first target was 50 pips above, or 50 cents above that. So it's just over, just over 38. And then I said, okay, my second target is going to be this Fibonacci here, just shy of it. So I said, okay, that. My third target, which I had the sneaking suspicion that it probably wasn't going to get there. But I put that in there because silver had been strong for so long, there was the possibility that that scene was going to continue in the market. Biss said, where did I put my stop? Simple 45 points below the uh, 20 MA. So I had a very tight stop on it. I wasn't, I really didn't want that big a stop on it, so... It was, you know, it was, it was very small indeed. So the market continues on, hits my first target, and it starts to, you know, it kind of pushes up past the 30, and that was good. So it's my first target. I'm like, okay, great. I move my stop to break even at that point, which is something that I had mentioned that to you guys that I would. My second target was here, and so I said, okay, let's see how the market responds to this. It has held above the 20 MA, not with necessarily with vigor. It's not like it took this and then just launched. But it kind of just continued on its way. So the continuing on its way, because it was smaller candles, was suggestive that that tentative nature was still present in the market. The market wasn't totally convinced this was a legitimate buy-up. If, if it was really a legitimate buy-up, we'd be seeing much larger candles, much more force, much more like this. But that really only happened once. So again, you know, it's taken now eight or nine candles to regain back what it's lost in two candles tells you the sellers still are the more dominant force in the market. The market continues on, and it's kind of hesitating. It's using the 20 MA support, which is good for my trade, confirms that, but it's really starting to peter out here, and it's communicating with these small candles after that buyers aren't coming in in droves, 
and they're not coming in with large amounts of money. If they were, we'd be seeing much bigger candles. So this starts to put an alarm on my radar here, suggesting, you know what, I have to be aware this trade might not go as far as I want it to. I have already brought the stop to break even. So at that point, I said, you know what, let's go ahead and move the stop to plus cost. So I covered my spread on that one as well. So I'd already banked some profit, but I said, okay, let's cover my spread on this one. And then let's see what happens around this Fibonacci here. So the market then continues. It sort of drifts. And then it makes it towards the Fibonacci. And I said, okay, great. Taking profit number two. Now let's lock our stop behind where this one is here, where we took profit on the first one. And then all of a sudden, you know, I see that and I'm like, I see these next two candles and I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. Okay, it stops right at the Fibonacci. Barely goes past it, sells off here, and I'm like, okay, you know, we'll see. I've seen dojis before. They've not always resulted in reversal. <clears throat> but then this candle, this was the nail in the coffin for me. I saw this and I said, well, wait a minute. That's vigor. That's strength. It hits a Fibonacci and then sells off in one candle what took a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Nine, 36 hours of gains, which were timid at best, were now completely undone with four hours of selling. This candle confirms that this move was legitimate and that the market, the sellers are still in control. And as I said last week and the week before, institutions are always comfortable trading pullbacks, especially when they feel confident that the trend is going to continue because they look at it as an opportunity to sell it at a higher price or buy it at a cheaper price. They're comfortable with pullbacks. They don't freak out when a pullback happens and think, okay, the trend's over. Institutions are very smart and they know that trends can often pull back and they look at them as great opportunities to just resell it again in this case. And they did. They waited till the 38.2 came and that they said, okay, we're going to sell it with vigor. And they do. They completely take out the 20 EMA again in one shot, and it closes on the lows, suggesting that for this four hours that they were selling the entire time, and they never stopped selling into the close, because if they did, you would have seen a wick on the bottom side that would have pushed back, suggesting they took profits. On top of it, we never saw buyers come into the market that were saying, hey, you know what, uh, we're going to push back on this. They couldn't. If they did, they got completely squashed. If they had come in with some force, you would see a wick on the bottom. But they didn't. There was none, suggesting that the sellers were completely in control. While this was happening simultaneously, I'm going to flip up another chart here. No, not that one. Keep in mind, Silver had a massive sell-off, pulled to the 38.2. At the same time, oh, yay. hold on one second. Oh, I'll just switch over. Make it easy. At the same time, oil was doing something very interesting. It also had a sell-off, and it also pulled right to a Fibonacci and then started to sell off. Now, oil's bounce was a little more convincing. It was a lot more dominantly blue. The blue candles had a lot more vigor to them. It's a lot more wicks to the downside, really suggesting that there were some serious buyers behind this. And the sell-off wasn't quite as aggressive. But then, all of a sudden, oil starts to get pretty aggressive as well. And I say, wait a minute. Oil goes to a fib after the massive sell-off, rejects off of it, and then starts off aggressive selling. And so does silver. And I said, you know what, these both are going back down, and they're probably going back down to where they at least started this entire bounce. So I began to sell oil and silver at the same time. I actually sold oil at 101.90, because when, at the time, I said, wait a minute, we've broken off this Fibonacci, silver's already starting to get aggressive. If this breaks below this 20 MA and the Fibonacci in one shot, I'm going to sell it. So I sold at 101.90, just below that there. I basically sold the two commodities at the same time. Now, I was seeing both this happen here, and I said, you know what? 
now I got to go short on silver. And this was critical because, again, as I've said before, and I sold once I saw this candle here. Once this candle had closed below 20, I said, that's the nail in the coffin. I'm going short. Now, this is critical because it's very important that traders never get married to one side of the market. I am all for supporting monogamous relationships in real life. But when it comes to trading, I am completely polygamous in the sense that I am open to either side of the market. I'm open to being long or short, and I don't get married to one side of the market and convinced that's the only way to do it. You know, I am... Flex, I, I've developed over the years a certain flexibility to not be attached to one side of the market or my particular views or any particular views at the same time. I have to be open to both sides of the market. If I was fixed in the belief that silver is going to bounce because maybe I have been watching silver for a long time and it had been trending and trending and trending and climbing. I've been watching silver since it was like $9. So to watch it go from 9 to 50 it's hard not to want to be long silver. And I'll confess, long term, I'm happy to buy silver for various reasons. I, if I had to hold on to a position for the next three years, I would rather be long silver than short silver. I'll confess, I totally would. But in real time, the price action was communicating, right now we're going to sell off. We've run into that Fibonacci resistance. We've just taken out the last eight or nine hours or eight or nine candles of buying in one candle of selling, sellers are still in control. You better get short. If you try and sing long, you're going to get hurt. So I said, okay, that's it. That's all we need to know. Now, with that, ooh, I got some questions here. So I've already answered Biss's question. So Dry Desert, do you have any idea why institutions would start selling again exactly at this point? You know, no, I don't. I mean, it could be various reasons. It could be they were looking for uh, an excuse to, to sell it again, and sometimes the Fibonacci offers a good point to that. Um, oftentimes, institutions know, again, institutions know, they, they're they very experienced at this, so they can generally tell when a trend is over and when a trend is not. And so what happens is that as I said, they often look for opportunities to sell it higher on pullbacks if they believe the trend is going to continue. And so with that being said, you often want to look towards a situation where the buyers have come in to some degree that would give some confidence to the long side and suck some buyers in so that when you do short it and reverse it, those people will add to your side of the market. And you can often have a certain impact by selling at a, a level that a lot of people will recognize. That doesn't mean they're always going to sell at Fibonacci levels, and that's just one theory as to why they shorted there. To be honest, I don't know all the reasons why, and I don't really care why. It doesn't matter to me why. Um, it doesn't matter to me why institutions buy or sell for the most part. What matters to me is what they're doing and how I can make money from it. And there's no way I can get all the collective whys together because there's too many diverse interests in the market, especially in silver, which is traded globally. You're never going to get all the whys together into one compact why. So hopefully that answers your question. To me, it really didn't matter. The bottom one is that they did and that I need to be awake to that. Yaki, good to have you back. I haven't seen you in a while. You said, why did you decide to look at oil specifically? I was watching oil because I was watching how, how it was kind of moving in a synchronous manner to the silver. You know, it had also had an incredible run as of late. Let's go back to oil. And it had a very similar behavior to silver. So I said, you know, it's a highly traded commodity. When, you know, and it's, even though it has a lot of different fundamental interests as to why people buy or sell it, the bottom one is they have been moving kind of together, and they'd sold off together. And I was looking at it as kind of a clue as to whether people were also going to be selling aggressively in silver, or maybe the people that were selling aggressively in silver would also be selling other commodities such as oil. So with that being said, um, I, was, I, it, I can't explain the exact why. There's a few whys. 
but I also have to acquire some of it to trader intuition. You know, I, there's there's a lot of reasons, but again, I've been doing this a really long time, and I've seen so many different patterns and formations and situations, you know, pull themselves out, and I've seen this before, and something inside my brain just said, take a look at oil, watch oil at the same time, and see if it gives you any clues. If it does, it's probably cueing you into something as well. So call that trader intuition, call that 10 years experience, call that 20, 30,000 of hours of sitting behind charts and markets. That's, I mean, if you want to know the real why, that's probably why. Sometimes I can't explain things like that. They just happen. So um, hopefully answers your question. All right, Jez. So are you saying you can be in a short and then the same time if the setup qualifies, you can also go long the same pair? Um, no, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, sorry, I had to take a drink. What I am saying is, is that if you're a really good student of price action and a really good student of the markets, even though you may have a lot of intuition, analysis, ideas, thoughts about the market trades that are all pointing to the long side, that you have to be flexible in your mind to be able to reverse course and say, you know what, I need to get out of this. I need to get out of this position long and I need to go short. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm not saying you have to, you want to be long and short at the same time. I'm saying you want to learn to be flexible, that if you're wrong, that you might be wrong for a good reason, and the other side of the market might be screaming, hey, get short, even though you wanted to be long and thought you should be long. So hopefully that answers your question there. Okay, getting back to I want to get to a few more questions, and I want to get back to this. We've got some good questions here. This said, do you trade CFDs, futures, or spot? If you trade commodities, and which is which is better in your opinion? Thanks. Yeah, I do trade CFDs. Um, I don't trade really futures that much. Um, I trade, you know, index futures. But you know, I I you know I generally prefer CFDs or spot. Um, I trade commodities as as we're talking about right now. In terms of the commodities I trade, I like silver better than gold. Um, I think there's just too many diverse interests in gold and the, if you really study the price section of gold, it's, it's incredibly volatile and incredibly choppy and there's a lot of wicks on both sides of the fence. And I generally don't like to be in instruments that have a lot of wicks on both sides because it tells you that there's just a lot of extreme volatility and the, and the market can whipsaw really fast in both directions there. You know, like things that are much more technically pure. And silver tends to move in a very technically pure fashion. So um, I prefer silver over gold. I do like trading oil, but being what I know about oil and the oil markets um, and the people I know in the oil business, it is such a manipulated market that I really don't like trading it because it is ridiculously manipulated. You know, it's manipulated in a morally offensive way. And so because of that, I, I generally don't like trading oil too much. I generally trade oil in unique opportunities, and that's really it. Um, you know, one day I would really like to write a book on the oil markets and, you know, how, you know, it's really traded on an insider level and um, the institutions and everything like that. It, it would It would offend a lot of people. Um, not just the people who are manipulating it, but also it would offend a lot of people who want to just trade. You know, people who just want to trade the markets and, you know, really don't like the fact that people are doing stuff like that and it's affecting the global economy. Um, it's offensive. It's morally offensive to me that some of the things that they do. So that's why a lot of times I have reservations about trading oil. Uh, and I'm still wrestling with that. So anyways, hopefully answers your question. Um, handsome from India. Chris, what do you think about the year right now? You know, I'll get into the year. I want to finish this year. I want to finish this silver and oil. Talk about some of the price section behind it. And then 
I want to talk about silver right now. Why I would not recommend trading silver right now. Uh, and yeah, I might go missing, laughing out loud. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> but I don't think so. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I'll get to I'll get to the year after I finish these here. Okay, um, last few questions in the red air. Sounds like institutions are waiting for 20 moving average and fib to sell. I thought 50 MA is also normal use. Yeah, institutions use 50, but the 20 is just going to have a lot more opportunities behind it. Um, it's going to have a lot more opportunities, and it's a lot more consistent. Um, I find that the market tends to respond to the 20 because it it's kind of like this four-hour chart. It's sensitive to shorter-term price action but also has a good finger on the pulse for a longer-term price action. So it dances in both worlds. Whereas the 50 really is a longer-term price action moving average. And so you're not going to get as much play off it. It's going to be much more infrequent. Um, so hopefully answers your questions. But again, it's not like institutions just have one program. Hey, let's just wait for the 20MA and the FIB to sell. They have many. Um, it, takes, it takes skill and practice and experience to learn when to use what. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, last two, and that's it, and then we'll get back into this here. Dave, were you also long, were also long USD as a result of the commodity itself? In this case, I was. I had a choice between selling uh, silver against euro and selling silver against the dollar, and the euro at that time was falling off. So I chose to sell it against the dollar because to me that was the better choice. I would make more money that way, and I was right. Um, not that I wanted to be long USD as uh, a consistent thing, but um, I wanted to, you know, find the and I wanted to trade the one that offered the best opportunities there. So, hopefully, answers your question. Last question, and then we'll move back on the price section. Dry desert writing about the oil industry. I don't think so. Might be dangerous. Certainly possible. Um, certainly possible. Would be. And you know what? I, at some point in my life, I probably will do it. I don't mind taking a risk to bring the truth out. I don't mind taking that risk um, because, you know, the truth can be very liberating for a lot of people. And so, you know, if I strongly feel about it, I don't mind standing up for it and I don't mind putting my life on the line for something. If I really believe it, you know, I have put my life on the line for something before. Uh, and I really believed in what I was doing, and it worked out fine, you know, and it may or may not, but I'd rather make a stand than make no stand. You know, I'd rather fight for truth than not fight at all. So that's just my thoughts on that one. Okay, so getting back to this here, the impulsive market was clearly to the downside. We have a decently corrective move that's still timid in nature, has a flatter angle, suggesting that the market is not fully convinced of it, and... So then the market sells off, comes back to this Fibonacci, as we talked about, and then starts the aggressive sell-off here. And this close below the 20MA was the nail in the coffin for me to get short. My trailing stop had already gotten tripped, so I'd already banked a couple profits on that. And that was fine. I was happy with that. But then I said, with this happening here, instead of feeling like, okay, I was wrong on my trade, I just said, you know what, it's time to get short. So I got short on the first close below. I said, this thing just closed below. I'm getting short right now. I believe this is going to hold below the 20 EMA, and I'm going to stay in it until I think it's going to peter off, or until I see price action starting to peter off, but my guess is, is that price is going to peter off around the same level that this whole bounce to the, started with, and I think the same thing is going to happen in oil, and then the market starts to sell off with even more aggression. This candle confirms that the sell-off was further legitimate. Why? Well, let's break it down. We run into a Fibonacci. One candle takes out the previous eight or nine, which confirms that this original sell-off was totally jitter and is coming back into the four. The market opens, goes up just a little bit, rejects back down, and slams back down, and again closes towards the lows, suggesting that there's a further continuation of the selling. On top of it, this candle is larger than the previous candle, which was already strong suggesting that this selling is getting more aggressive. So I should be expecting the market to go even further. Where did I take my first profit? I said, you know what, 35, I'm going to take some at 35, 
partially because it's a round number, partially because it's possible anybody who wants to buy silver may get in it before we get to these lows again. So I said, I'm going to take my first profit at 35, but I'm going to watch the price section to see how it responds. If it starts to taper off around these bottoms, then I want to look to get out and then see if there's another re-entry. The market does taper off a little bit. This candle is noticeably shorter than these two. We had two candles that were expanding in size, getting bigger, also closing towards the lows, and now we have one then that shrinks in size. It does have almost no wick to the top side, and it does have a very little wick to the bottom side, suggesting that the selling was consistent, but it was tapered off. It wasn't as aggressive as it was before, and it wasn't an expansion in aggression to the sell side. It was a reduction in aggression. It kept the regression in play, but it was a reduction in aggression, telling me that the slowing or the selling is starting to slow off, and I might expect a bounce sometime soon. And that's when it starts to happen. I see this candle right here, so I said, you know what? I wanted to get out at 35. It was just shy of it, 35.02. I had actually missed my profit target by literally the spread. And so I said, you know, on the close of this candle, I'm going to take the majority of my profit off, and then I'm going to leave one-third of it still on, and I'm going to move my stop just above the 20 MA, because the 20 MA is going to hold it as resistance, then this should continue to sell off again. Well, it starts to do that, but then guess what? It continues to sell off, and it adds on more aggression to that. And where does it go right back to? Exactly towards the lows where this whole thing started. Now, if it can bust through this with aggression, with vigor, then I'll look to add on more positions to it. But if it gets stuck here, then I should probably take off the remaining portions of my position here. And it starts to break through it, but it keeps getting these wicks to the downside. Notice how this wick is decent. It's right around the same area. And this wick is even longer. Even though there was selling, this wick is even longer. It opens, barely goes up, sells off, but then we run into, again, somebody wants to buy this here. And it closes right around here. And I said, until we get a close below this thing, I'm not going to add on new positions, and I'm going to taper off the rest of my position. So how does the market respond to all this? It starts to bounce back up, further confirming that, you know what, this bounce is legitimate here. This is kind of a line in the sand. We don't want to be adding any more shorts. On it, and look what happens. It gets more aggressive, challenges the 20 MA, and actually makes a decent sized run to the upside. Retraces probably about, if I had to guess, this is probably a 50% Fibonacci of that. Let's see if I'm correct. Close enough. Just past the 50 in between 50 and 61.8. So it makes another Fib, but instead of bouncing to the 38.2, which is a shallow bounce, it bounces to the 50, suggesting a deeper bounce. And then makes higher lows, and then gets really choppy suggesting, you know, I don't want to be in this. Furthermore, I had talked about the importance of looking at the weekly chart, and this is why I'm not taking any new positions on silver. This was last week's price action. This is incredibly choppy, and this is these are the kind of candles that you you don't want to trade immediately after. Rarely do you want to trade immediately after this. Um, why is that? Because you have a massive amount of rejection on the downside, suggesting strong interest to the downside, and you also have strong interest to the sell side. People want to sell it as it gets higher. So, And the wicks are almost of equal size, suggesting that the forces on both sides of the market are relatively equal, at least they were for that week, and we don't want to add any new positions until we see aggressive action on one side or the other. Now, the market has opened up, hit the 20 MA and started selling off. That's good. But the bottom line is, I don't want to take any new positions inside this massive rejection zone. This whole zone here is all rejection of price action, which means that nobody was accepting prices being comfortable there, meaning that the chances of prices staying there or closing within their region become very low because people have already spent two weeks saying, guess what, we don't accept prices being here. So why would I buy or sell in a region where people aren't accepting it. That means I have the chance of running into that same rejection again. I want to buy or sell in areas that either fully support a complete rejection of one side of the market or the other, not both, and I don't want to buy or sell in particular regions where they have 
you know, this kind of price section where it says, guess what? We just won't keep prices there. We're going to push it right back up. Can't really sell it. I can sell it to 20 MA, but I'm kind of going up against a very short-term support here. And I don't want to be buying it because the sell pressure is still on. So I'm now completely aside on silver. As of last week, I was done with silver, and I just said, okay, I'm waiting for something new right now. So hopefully that explains some of the price action and methodologies and the techniques that I use when trading this. I wanted to go over it step by step because I was watching every single candle very, very closely, analyzing every single candle very, very closely, intensely. I was incredibly focused on just silver and oil during that time period. And by the way, what did oil do? Silver went right back to where it started. So did oil. Right back to where it started. So both trades ended up working out really well. Now, let's get into some questions here. We covered a lot of ground there. Okay, John T says, T's according to Ted Blair again, or is silver is the most manipulated market there is. There is definitely some manipulation in silver. There was an attempt to corner the market, but it's not even close to as pervasive as the oil industry. It's not even close. Um, you you got to remember, silver is not a commodity that's necessary for the functioning of the global economy. Oil is. Oil is present in so many products that you would be shocked to find out how many products, everyday things that you touch, work with, feel, look at, use, are based on oil and petroleum and fossil fuels. It's a globally, right now it's a product that the whole global economy functions on. So there's much more pervasive trading in oil than there is in silver. Silver is not. It's not necessary for the functioning of everyday life. And so because of the the day-to-day -day necessity of oil, there's far more involvement in oil than there is in silver and there's far more manipulation on it because you got to remember the people that control oil have massive financial interest in oil and there's a lot of those people there's a lot more people with financial interest in oil than there is in silver globally there's just there's no debate about that there's just more and there's also more money in oil right now than there is in silver globally and there's no debate about that. So in reality, oil is a far more manipulated market than silver is. Okay, Abel says, do you prefer trading Forex or commodity futures? I prefer Forex and, and spot commodities. I like trading, you know, spot silver, spot gold. Well, spot silver more. Um, I like trading those. Um, I like them both. You know, I like commodities because they're fun. Um, you know, and they're, there's just, especially the ones that have a very technically pure movement system. Silver has a very technically pure movement to it. Oil can, but oil also has a lot of, you know, herky-jerky manipulation behind it as well. Um, whereas uh, Forex, you know, I love trading Forex as well. I like trading both. But I've just been, I've been much more active on the commodities over the last two weeks because they offered the best trading opportunities out there. Um, that's why I'm covering them. See, SP Nagera, when do you know that the price action is doing a reversal in a trade with price action? Do you use any indicators, ATR, candlestick patterns? What do you use? Um, I don't really use any indicators to confirm that a reversal is happening. Um, you know, I, the only indicator I really use when trading price action um, is that uh, the 20 MA, which you see on the chart right now. And I use that on the 4-hour dailies or weekly time frames. Any time frame I have a 20 MA, but you know, most of my price action trading is off the 4 hours and dailies. Um, now, your question, this is, this is the interesting part of your question. When do you know that the price action is doing a reversal in a trade with price action? Your question implicitly suggests that there is one thing that I'm looking at that tells me, okay, this one thing happened, I know. And it's not one thing that I know. 
And I understand the nature of your question. It's always nice to want to have that one thing that tells me when a reversal in place. But this market is a little more complex and diverse than that. There's never just one thing that tells me this is a reversal. I do have one method that's fantastic for calling tops and bottoms, but it's not the only method I use for calling tops and bottoms. What I use is pure price action analysis. And I've gone over the price action in today's class talking about this buy-up, talking about the tentative nature of it, talking about the angles, talking about the size of the candles in relationship to these, talking about the frequency of these candles in relationship to this, talking about impulsive versus corrective. In reality, to some degree, I have already answered your question. I've answered it with all the things that I've mentioned in this entire class. I use all those things to determine when there is a reversal. And this last candle, as I said before, was the final nail in the coffin. It confirmed the timidity of this buy-up. It confirmed that this flat angle was more than likely profit-taking than it was impulsive buying. It confirmed that the market wasn't convinced that this was a really solid buy-up because the candles weren't getting larger and larger like this expression was when it started to sell off. It confirmed that the sellers are far more powerful than the buyers when one candle completely takes out the previous eight or nine. So to answer your question, I've kind of already answered it in the very description of this class. And I've gone over all the techniques. And I've just mentioned them again, so hopefully that gives you some idea. Um, Remy says, is it better to start selling when the first candle closes below the 20 May or wait for the second candle open and close below the 20 May, i.e. get confirmation? Generally, in these types of things, I wait for the first candle, especially when the, that first candle is just so aggressive and poignant. It was so strong. It was so direct. Um, you know, it came right off of a Fibonacci level to the T. Oil came right off of a Fibonacci level to the T at the exact same time. You know, the one candle took out, boom, all these previous ones, and it closed on the absolute low. All of those things were really pointing a picture for me, saying, hey, this is legitimate, sell now. If it really is going to hold the 20 May, as if the 20 May really is going to hold it, you're about as close to it as you could possibly get. No need to actually wait for another one. So hopefully answers your question. It's an excellent question. Um, this is, wow, I think... You can't learn that trading method except when you have 10 plus years of trading on your back. Maybe, not necessarily. You know, you can learn that faster than I could because you can keep coming back to this class and that will probably save you a lot of time. When I was learning how to trade, there weren't people teaching classes like this. There was nobody really talking about price action in this particular way. I had to, I had to learn all this for myself. <clears throat> you know, there, when I studied price action, there was very few people talking about price sections. Plenty of people talking about Bollinger Bands and MACD and RSI and all these things. Very few people talking about price section. It is growing in popularity as a few people are starting to champion it. But the bottom line is, is that there weren't people teaching this when I was learning how to trade way back in 2001. You know, I had to learn this myself. I had to teach myself this. Luckily, I had a good base of knowledge to work with. And I had a perspective on the markets that allowed me to look into the markets in a very unique fashion. And I wasn't attached to one paradigm than the other. So because of that, I had a certain flexibility of mind to really peer into the market and say, how can I understand this price section? And I spent a lot of time meditating and reflecting on this and really digesting this and staring at charts over and over and over again. And so, you know, you could do it faster than I could by keep coming to classes like this, by studying material, you know, like this, by taking courses on this. That's how you can do it. So it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that long. Eklava, when a corrective move can become impulsive, even we can't know that. We can keep on assuming that this is corrective, even with small candles. Totally. And that's why it's important to, it's very important to learn how to study price action in real time and understand what that's communicating to you. Because if you did, you could have come to the same decision I did and made the same trade I did. There's nothing precluding you from not making this same trading decision. You could you could absolutely have made the same trading decision 
it seems like you can't right now because there's a gap between, you know, one level of knowledge and the other. And only the only thing you're seeing is the gap. But you're not actually seeing that there was one point in time I was exactly where you were. So, and, and you know what? In some sense, I'm in the same position you are. I can't totally know exactly when a corrective move can become impulsive. I can't know that for sure. I just have to watch, be very attentive in real time, have my finger on the pulse, and then jump on the opportunity when it comes. And if I'm right, I'm right, and I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and I'll learn through experience either way. There are other things you can do to further study up that. You know, you can do screen records of your trades. Get Camtasia. And then when you're about to make a trade, spend five minutes before talking about it, describing what you see, record the trade as it happens in real time, and then talk about it after as it happens, and then record the final end result of it. And then review that. Just like a professional football player, basketball player, reviews tapes of their games or other players' games. You could do that. My guess is a lot of people probably aren't doing that. Well, guess what? You can do that to help become a better trader and accelerate your learning curve. So hopefully it answers your question. John C. says, we would argue that silver is necessary for everyday life, but not as much as oil. Case in point, not as much as oil. Um, silver is such a small market compared to oil. Exactly. So that, And you could say, therefore, it's easier to manipulate. I would say the hands that manipulate oil have far bigger swings and influences in the market than silver in the sense that, you know, if we want to, we can argue this, but the bottom line is the actual forces involved in manipulating oil are far stronger and more potent and powerful from a purely effect standpoint than silver. And there's a lot of people that trade silver because they have a real interest in it in the sense of they're not a big oil company just trying to maximize their profit. Maybe they're concerned about upcoming risks or things like that. So there's a lot more, you know, if, if it wasn't as manipulated, it would be moving less purely. So, you know, the bottom, I mean, we, we could argue about that. There's no really point, um, point in splitting hairs there. Anthony Rivel, do you ever, you ever use volume on your charts, tick volume? Not really. Um, no, not really. Um, I have a source for volume. That's an institutional source that gives me volume. And I use that. But even then, I really only use that to more so look at the big picture. I don't use it on a micro level. I'm really just trying to see the big picture with that. Um, Abel, in Silver's case, the reversal came when it touched the fib, and after it spent a little time above the 20 May. So the fibs played a more important part. Yeah. They, I, I, you know, I can't really say that the fibs necessarily played a more important part. You know, because, and, and I don't, and the reason why I'm not going to really give you a certain answer is because I don't want you to get fixed or married to fibs being more important than 20 MA. Sometimes the fibs have absolutely no relevance whatsoever. Um, in this case, the fibs are very, very potent. Um, but also at the same time, the 20 MA played a very important role. It rejected it here, rejected it here, supported, 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 supported here. Then once it broke below that, it supported it again or, or rejected it again. So, you know, a lot of time was spent relating to the 20 MA when only one or two candles was spent relating to the FIB. Um, the FIB was the line in the sand at this point in time. The next time it might not be. I don't want you to get married to that. So, um, yes, it's important to pay attention to it, but not something you want to marry to. All right, last few questions, then we're going to wrap it up. When there is a correlation of silver, USD, oil, USD, then maybe it's all about USD weakness. Or USD strength. Keep in mind, both of these both sold off, so the US got, dollar got stronger against these. So something to keep in mind. Um, it could be both sides of the market. Um, but again, I wouldn't necessarily think about it as just USD weakness or just USD strength. Um, there are many other reasons for that. Nikki No Pips, I love that name. It's like the gangster name for uh, for currency trading. Um, like some 1920s gangster. It's awesome. Um, do you think the mass influx of retail traders over the years has had an effect on market dynamics? <sighs> yes and no. And that's a, that's a very, that's a big question. It's a loaded question. Um, and here's why. 
It's a loaded question for a lot of reasons. The bottom line is if you sum up all the retail traders as a whole, we still only account for 3% of the spot market. So we're still not that big a piece of pie where we have a major influence over. Even though we've seen a massive influx, so have the institutions up their level as well. So it's not like we're getting that much bigger pieces of the pie and becoming a bigger force to reckon with here. You know, it's it, we're still very small in that aspect. But also the massive influx of traders has had an effect on institution strategies to some degree. You know, some of them have become more market makers and market providers instead of, um, or liqui and liquidity providers instead of, you know, trading, you know, taking trades and taking positions in the market, you know, instead of being counterparties. Um, some of them have changed their proprietary strategies. So yes and no on both sides of the market. But, you know, the bottom line is we're not reshaping the, the international market per se. You know, we're just kind of moving along with the trend. All right. Last question, and then uh, our last two questions. <laughs> How many days does it take for the webinar to be able, available for repeat? Um, I think um, this recording will be available in the next few days, so just wait, and then you can uh, watch it again. Um, and then, Boyke, do I still do yoga every single day? Every single day I do yoga and meditation. So hopefully answers your question. Okay, great. I want to thank you all very much for coming to this class. Uh, it was awesome to have you all here, uh, every one of you individually. Uh, fantastic questions across the board, very engaging. In fact, uh, since we had such a great list, I want to go down the list and thank everybody for coming. William Boyke, Chelsea, Carl, uh, Gert, Ray, William, Yaki, Bill W., Bart, Philippe, Terry, UK, Emmanuel, Hansen from Indonesia, Nighty, Rami, Lika, Willow, JT, Dave, Baka, Sheep, Vivek, Alan, Yun, um, Ken May, Rafa, Carly, Trey Daily, Zul, Abel, Jocelyn, MC, DBO, Bob, AC, Nikki, No Pips, Marinko, Tuvok, Fernando, CK, Haley, good to have you back. Wish you were back the week before. Uh, Man Bear Pig, Niklava, Sisarka, Kenny, Zephyr, Steely, Pablo, Trey Jones, Vim, SP, Nagara, great questions, AX, Moran, Tom G, Genius FX, Dean, Anthony, Gino, Alex, John, Jez, Mark Timer, Sissy Vana, good to have you back as well. Abe Gonzalo, if that's Gonzalo from FX Street, good to have you here as well. Yamamama, great name, Dry Desert, Rob, Samal, Ghana, and Andre. Thank you all very much for coming. Fantastic having every one of you here. I really appreciate it. It was great seeing you guys here, and thanks to FX Street for hosting this. Uh, keep checking back with them to see when this recording will be available. In the meantime, I wish you all the best of luck trading. I bid you all do, and I'll see you guys next week. Take care, everyone.